if you're doing a band call, as, as we all know, you don't necessarily know if you need a Vox amp or a Fender amp or a Marshall amp. Um, being able to flip, uh, switch it on the fly um, from your laptop as well with all the different parameters, you can, changing the sag or the uh, preamp or power amp gain or anything. Uh, the microphone placement uh, can be really, really handy. Uh, when, you know, because we're all under time crunch when we're rehearsing. So um, to be able to do it at your, at your station has, has been really good. Um, and, I mean, I'm sure that's the same with the, the Line 6 and the... Very much so, yeah. yeah. That's a good point, actually. Well, I think when you're doing the sort of stuff we all do, that sort of commercial work, session-y kind of thing, that's a good point that you do, sometimes when you turn up to these things, you don't know what sort of kit you're going to need. That's a really or good point. Or how much space, almost space, yeah. Well, you, I mean, you can pretty much count on having nearly no space. Um, so to have it all, and they're, they're all compact units to one degree or another. Um, I use the Helix and I use the floorboard version partly and only partly because it's very portable. Like if at a push on a fly date, you could throw that in your suitcase and just pack the essentials and it's all in there. Oftentimes you get into a venue with dodgy wiring. Mm. Um, you have to go get a noise suppressor, a noise gate or something, yeah. and you put it at the front, you put it at the sort of end of your pedal board or something, and then anytime you need a pinched harmonic or something, it's just going yeah. dead, and you've lost your high gain sound, you've lost any tactile response. Yeah. But if you're using a unit with lots of presets, and if it's intelligently organised, something like the XFX and is, is great, because you can change each patch with different levels, and mm. you can change the amps accordingly, quickly. Mm. So if you go to sound check in I don't know, Manchester or something, and you can't hear over the white noise of the lighting rig. You can just and do a global setting or an individual setting for each sound. Um, and that saves a gig. It saves you having to unplug everything and figure out what's causing the buzz or check your shielding on your guitar. Because if we, you're using strats or something, that's going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah I think all the, 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 the main modelers, they, they've really cracked this uh, toolkit you know, between effects and amp models, they, they offer everything that sounds great in any situation. I personally have been using the, the Kemper almost exclusively for the last year. And um, apart from the fact that, to my ears, sounds fantastic and feels like a, like a real amp, um, it's the fact that you can get sounds quickly. Sounds, effects, just anything else you can get to it very, very quickly. Because very often, uh, as you were saying, we turn up, we don't know what we're going to play. It could be a rehearsal, it could be a session. People say, okay, I want this type of sound. And <clears throat> with some of these units, you, you need to bring up a, uh, an amp model. Then you have to dial it in. And to do that quickly, you have to have spent time with it at home. You have to know it. The thing with the Kemper, because it works on profiles, by profiling an amp that has already been dialed in, effectively the sound that you bring up is already the sound of a dialed in amp. Um, the sheer amount that are available, you know, both from you know, third party sellers or um, free uh, uh, on the internet, some of which are very, very good, means that you can have, uh, I mean, I've got a th over a thousand on mine means that when, if, you, if you find a sound that is similar but not quite there you can just move on to the next one you can organize them by gain level so say if you need a high gain sound you can scroll through the highest gains or increasing gain sounds so it, it's very very rational the way it's been uh, the way that the, the layout has been thought out so say I find a um, uh, an amp sound that I like and I need a delay sound, I can quickly recall a delay, the right type of delay, and then I might have uh, stored a the edge type delay. I just recall the preset. So quickly recall the um, profile, recall the effect, recall the preset, and your sound is there. And in the context of a rehearsal where you've also have, uh, you've also got uh, dots to figure out, conductor cues, uh, the, the, everything's moving really quickly. Having that, it, for me, was a life changer, a game changer.
a helix, it's incredibly intuitive. The manual's like, given that a lot of it is diagrams, the manual's like maybe 40 something small pages and it's, it's meant to be intuitive. One, in ter terms of what we were just talking about, uh, being able to adjust things really quickly is an amazing function and it's, bear in mind, the thing with the Helix, it's, it's, it is right up there tonally. It's a great function and you can be playing along. Say you're playing a groove and you think, I've got too much drive or any function. You can, you can change it with your feet while you're playing and store that setting. So say you can think, oh, there's too much reverb in a rehearsal. And chugging along, just go into another mode, tap the top right button, hold it for a few seconds, flashes up, then you've got control over the parameter. Select the parameter, go into that, change it. With your feet? With your feet while you're that's playing and store it. Oh, the HD Pod did that as well, didn't it? Did it? Yeah, that's really, right. Yeah. I mean, the, really the, the, the Helix is so easy to use to the point where, to be perfectly honest, in preparing for this, I had to read the manual properly for the first time. The, the learning curve of the aspect I found was quite... I don't know if it was steep because I'm not good with lots of technology. I think it's steep because it's it. steep from what it's, everybody else has told me. It, it is incredible, uh, what because it, it, it does sort of everything as far as, as far as I can tell, and that's yeah. that's great. Um, and I did what I think a lot of people do now, which is... Which is um, I, I spent a bit of time with the manual to switch it on and make sure I wasn't going to fry anything um, by putting it in the wrong socket or anything. And, and then I, I went on to... Online went to forums, uh, checked the magazines, checked um, checked YouTube. There's some good, a good sort of beginner instructions. And one thing that I think all our units have in common is that the preset sounds are really good. Yeah. Which wasn't the case, uh, wasn't often the case with a lot of multi effects units or modelers uh, many years ago. Um, one actually, um, and um, I, one of my favourite things about the Line Six stuff actually was that their pilot handbook that they called it for the pod was really beautifully written, yeah. and that was really handy. Yeah. With the with the Axe effects, the preset sounds were so good that any time I need sounds, I go to a preset first. I don't normally build. I built up maybe two or three patches yeah. for weird like weird Ebo uh, atmospheric stuff where you need reverse delays and odd stuff. Everything else got an AC30 patch, sounds great. Then you can tweak it so because all these are quite guitar dependent if you're running a Strat or a Les Paul or something, which just takes experience to find. It's not going to necessarily say in a manual to tweak the input response or something. Um, but once, once you figure out just how to switch it on, the, the layout is pretty handy, then online is really helpful. I find with the Kemper, I actually like reading manuals, so I might be a bit Say of an what? exception in this. So uh, this is why I loved reading the Axe FX manual and going through all the possibilities and stuff. With the Kemper, I didn't. I think to this day, I don't think I've read the Kemper manual. Um, and the reason is, when you, when you look at the Kemper, you see all the lights and the screen and stuff. Looks a bit like a, the, the control panel of a spaceship. But when you look closely, the bottom part of the Kemper is, looks like an amp. You know, gain the EQ and the master out. And the top part is subdivided, it looks like your pedal board. You know, you've got the, the four stomp boxes that would go normally before your amp, and then you've got the, um, the, the, the buttons that activate the, uh, the effects that normally go in, in the effects loop, you know, time and uh, time-based effects and modulations. Um, and that's it. You want to switch it on, you press the button. You want to change what that button does, you press and hold and you access the menu so you can select you know, a compressor rather than a, uh, an overdrive or uh, whatever else. Um, then once you've recalled the amp model, then you can change the gain structure, you can change the EQ. And then of course, like all these things, they, there are uh, much more, in, many more parameters that are much more in depth um, but the um, but if you don't know about them, it, they they will still work under the bonnet without you knowing about them. Uh, once you get a little bit more pernickety about what you get from your sound, then you can discover those extra parameters and tweak them. However, the the, the important ones are accessible from the front panel, literally with one hand. If you've got an eight eight bars rest, uh, and you can just do the tweak. For me. That was, you know, obviously joined with the quality of the sound and the um, amount of sounds. It's probably the most important thing. In a rehearsal, when any, any sort of 
anything like that. We're not like keyboard players. We don't have someone on hand to program them for us well, while we're exactly, playing. Yeah. Our job isn't just to play the dots. We are responsible for our own equipment. Um, and that's where having a good enough understanding, whether we've read the manuals or not, yeah. just so that if something goes down or if a music supervisor comes in with a radically different approach, you, ha you have the flexibility. Just the basic know-how to delve into the programming. And I think it, being under the crunch, I mean, we haven't had the luxury necessarily of spending lots of time with it. And we've got through the gigs, which I think is a big endorsement of all, all, the, all the companies. I think that's, that's worked out quite well. Um, because um, actually going back to the point about the valve amps uh, thing, because I'm always happiest at home with a, a champ or something. Um, I think we've all done the on-stage gigs with the, the crank amps where you're part of the band and then they want you to take a solo and they have you on a wireless and you move, move forward for it. And because a lot of the great valve amps are sort of quite monodirectional. Um, and you're at the back and you're playing your chords and the guitar's resonating and you feel like you're a rock god uh, in your mind. And, uh, and then they say you want to take your solo, so you walk forward out of the range of the amp and there's no fold back for guitar on the front because it's all singers. And you play a solo and the sustain's gone. The audience hears the same thing, but feels like your guitar is just dead. And, and that's the point where you're relying so much on monitoring and the on-stage environment, which is often suboptimal. Um, that you put, I, I'd rather be direct at this point. I'd rather not have an amp that then compromises how I'm going to play yeah. for the times when I really need it. If it was always optimal, then it's always nice to have. That's where we find ourselves, isn't it? It's come to a point where there are, there are those kind of constraints on us. If you're doing a tour and you're in a different venue every night, uh, who knows what the venue's going to be like, what the acoustics going to be like, um, what the sound engineer's or if yeah, you turn right. up, if you turn up. Uh, for, for a gig at a theatre or a rehearsal and you have no control over the size of the room, you don't know who's on drums because that's often what I'm Particularly when you use something like, like a deluxe, exactly. yeah. it's, so sometimes it's not mine There's enough. no way you can predict which one of your amps would do a good job or if, if any of yeah. them. So in that sense, it, it just everything in life is a compromise. <laughs> so in that sense, you know, that, that way I know that a modeler can just can just deliver the goods. In and you know what you're getting out of it, don't yeah. you? It's the same yeah, for most, every time. Most gigs you don't need, you're not going to be fatiguing the audience with 15 different amp sounds. But to have the option of having those 15 per gig is really yeah. handy. Yeah. Yeah. The more processing power available is, yeah. is the best.
I, I, yeah, I, I have thought a lot about this. <laughs> the thing is that you, it, uh, people compare uh, valve amps and modelers all the time, but you need to compare like with like. So the trouser flapping uh, and an eardrum compressing vibe that you get from a, from a valve amp um, is a different thing from what you get from a modeler. What you have, what you get from a modeler is the signal um, of a valve amp that has been mic'd up. So if you want to make a fair comparison, uh, you shouldn't be plugging a studio speaker into a modeler and then putting a valve amp next to it and A, B those, it will not work because they are two radically different things. You know, when you talk about the trouser flapping vibe of a valve amp, you're thinking of a guitar speaker. A modeler doesn't have a guitar speaker. There is that option and we can discuss it, but it's a different, it's a different story. So if we wanted to compare like with like, we have to go in the studio, put an amp in the live room, mic it up, and then in the control room, we listen to the feed that comes from uh, the mic'd up amp, and then we listen to the feed that comes from the modeler. Because that's, that's what the modeler is emulating, is not the guitar speaker, is the guitar speaker that has been mic'd up and comes out through studio speakers. So both of them come out of uh, studio speakers, and then you can compare them. Uh, and actually, the evidence is, uh, you know, for all people who have tried both, yeah. that it's very hard to very hard to tell the difference, both in terms of sound when it's not you playing, and in terms of feel when it is you playing. I mean, I think they're all. I mean, I guess you're yet, yet to be persuaded of the Helix because you haven't tried one. But I don't know if it was video, but um, <coughs> Yamaha, who, who are on Line Six, put together this comparative test. Martin, the guy who's uh, the head of guitar at Yamaha, has got a ridiculous collection of amps, like the real thing. So he lined up like a, an old park, a JTM 45, a super lead, and they rigged them up with a 4x12 cab and then ran the Helix, uh, tried the effects into them and then tried the Helix into the PA. It was ridiculous. And I, I'm, I'm, they're all, all three pieces yeah, of kit. Yeah. They're very serious pieces of kit. I was absolutely blown away. People who are in love with valve amps, as, as we all are, mm. uh, we think of the subjective experience of being on stage with your amp behind you. But that's not what the audience are hearing 99% of the time, unless you're playing a small club and then the guy they're hearing the just mic two meters from you. Yeah, uh, so they're hearing the sound from the PA, which is, uh, of course, the sound of your amp mic'd up, yeah. which is precisely what the modeler emulates. Yeah. So once it goes through the PA, you know, um, the audience are really not m missing much of the whole guitar sound experience. Uh, you're not missing much if you're using in-ears, because what you would get is th not the real trouser flapping sound of your amp, but the mic'd up version of that. Uh, versus the modeler version of that. And those two are now so similar. They're basically both you, if you're using in-ears, and your audience, not to mention your band who will not be in the firing line of the amp, uh, they will get you in their monitors or in their in-ear monitors. Uh, I mean, ultimately, that um, thing that we all love about that, the pressure of a guitar speaker is a very subjective, um, experience that only happens to you on that stage and no other member of the band. It doesn't happen to the audience, it only happens to you and only when your amp is in the sweet spot. Another thing with live performance, especially if you're working with more than one guitarist, which immediately throws in lots of complications uh, in terms of tone, especially and volume, um, is that the louder you are with an amp on stage, the less they're going to put of you through the PA, which means that you're going to get this asymmetrical effect because amps are so focused in, in direction that um, part of the audience will hear lots of you and the other part won't hear much of you because they're not going to put an equal amount of you through the PA to compensate for that. So it becomes almost diminishing returns. It, just, it ends up defeating purpose. So, so an Axe FX or a Kemp or a Line 6 would be great for that. Just because the more control you have at each facet of the sound production, 
the easier it is for everyone else. Because a lot of time in our gigs, the band have to be absolutely tight and on the money. But in terms of production levels, we're the least important part of it in terms of the audience. And we just have to be right. And the volume levels have to be consistent so the dancers or the singers can hear what they need to hear without hearing too much of it and so on. And it just it makes life really easy. Amps, of course, have their own beautiful thing to them in the sweet spot, as you say, Nick. And, um, but the thing I like with uh, the Axe FX uh, is that the sort of transient response of hitting it, they, they've, they've got the modelling right so that you hit the note, you can almost sort of hear the fret, you hear that really crystalline um, attack on the note, which you can then, you can, but it really feels like an amp that's sort of, not blooming, but uh, sort of starting to break up where you can feel that if you hit it a bit harder, it's going to compress a bit more. It's going, um, and especially if you're listening to it on in-ear monitors, which are, it's a very isolated, a literally isolating experience. Um, and if you're doing, yeah, I mean, you know, last year they were doing over 800 shows of it, so you get so used to hearing certain sound. Um, getting that dynamic control with your pick is very good. You can hear that. Whereas if, if I was using a badly mic'd guitar cab, I'm, I might be flailing in the wind, having no idea what the sort of... What is. In terms of this discussion, of the, this idea of how these things work, it's so rare, even on the biggest gigs I've ever done, like massive gigs where, I mean, a huge production, huge team of people working. It's, it's still very rare to find yourself in a situation where you've got the, the, the luxury of having the time and the staff and the equipment to do it sort of like the Larry Carton thing where you play play a lovely amp and your reverbs add it after it's come out of the <laughs> speaker. Mixer, yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, there's yeah. no time for that. Like, I don't even want to say who the artist is, but somebody I played, <laughs> did um, huge gigs with somebody really, really big. Um, uh, this is when I was using that PC2 thing, which I loved, really posh effects. And, uh, an 80 watt Buddha super drive, which is really good, yeah. fairly loud into a 4x12 cup. But that's like the, it was under the stage or at the back of the stage. And a couple of times I managed to creep around there and hear it. It was roaring. But even then, if I'd said, Can I have that in stereo? The answer is, No, you can't have it in stereo. We don't have time for that. The, the thing I find about modelers is that. Well, you, you were in a gig on, uh, of that sort of that magnitude with that amount of people and suddenly hearing it in stereo was a, too much of a bother. And then, uh, you know, Kemper, Axe FX, Helix, uh, you can have your effects in beautiful stereo with the amps cooking, you know, right in the sweet spot. and. And, and everything that you've chased all your life is suddenly really happening, night after night after yeah. night. It's a really, and especially when you when you've got um, uh, in-ear monitors and you get a full and a beautiful stereo image, it's a uh, it's a really amazing which it's a really amazing experience. Yeah. Which in turn affects how you play. Affects how you, how play the you know, mm -hmm. you 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 go home much happier. <laughs> Thank you. 